Hello everyone, my name is Anitsu and I'm back with another Digimon video. So today I'm going to be talking about the BT11 meta and where it currently is so far as of the April 2023 rules updates. So as far as uh, where the meta currently is, well, this is where the meta has came from, and it came from being a Black War Greymon dominated format, with it taking up 33% of the meta. Grandis uh, was the second forerunner because it was the best natural counter to Black War Greymon, so it took up roughly about 21% of the meta, and then everything else seemed to be having a really hard time struggling to fight for top slots between these two decks. But uh, now in April, we got uh, a new rules change, and uh, on top of that, uh, we got uh, BT11 Greymon X Antibody uh, limited down to 1, so we naturally would expect uh, that the meta is going to change just because Black War Greymon X being the big gatekeeper isn't necessarily going to be as big of a gatekeeper without uh, that speed and tempo that uh, Greymon X antibody is offering it to allow it to move as fast as it needs to be to keep up with the rest of the meta. That's not saying that the deck is completely dead in the water just because of this limit, it's just there to slow it down and this rules update does the job quite nicely and uh, the deck is still somewhat viable. So as far as uh, what actually changed in April. As I already mentioned, uh, Black War Greymon X getting limited to 1 really already is going to shake up a lot of things just because now the best deck loses a lot of its steam and tempo. Then on top of that, we did get a brand new mulligan rule. So uh, this mulligan rule does uh, change the dynamics on how we set up the game, and this could uh, favor OTK and combo-based decks. Then on top of that, we also got the Beelzemon starter deck, which is basically adding a brand new deck that's going to be viable inside of the format, which again uh, changes the matchup spread in terms of uh, what's going to be able to compete and what's not going to be able to compete. But as far as the very first BT11 event with these rule changes, we had the uh, Raid and Trade EU Regionals. So you could see the uh, breakdown on what got top 16, and I think this is actually a pretty decent spread. You have uh, five Beelzemon decks, uh, two uh, cross seven decks, two all force decks, one uh, cross Merva, one Grandis, one Black War Greymon X, one Security Control, one Bloom Lord, one Dark Knightmon, and one Metal Guru Mon X. So we could see just based on this one event alone that the reduction in uh, Black War Greymon X really is uh, changing how the rest of the format is going to be played just because it's no longer uh, the number one deck anymore and decks are actually able to fight against it. But the fact that it's still topping means that it's still a competitively viable deck. And then recently we had the Carta Magica North American regionals take place, and we could see that even though it wasn't as diverse as the EU regionals, we still have a pretty decent spread so far. So we have uh, five uh, cross Mervas, uh, four cross sevens, two Beelzemon, one uh, Minerva Loop, uh, one Black War Greymon, one Ancient Greymon OTK, one Security Control, and one Eximon. So Black War Greymon is still managing to make it into top slots uh, here and there. So again, the goal of that limitation was to not kill off the deck, but reduce its overall power, which as we can see based on these two events, the power has been reduced significantly. But we could start seeing an emergence of what actually is powerful enough to be able to maintain and claim the majority of these top slots. So as far as where the meta currently is, we could see off of these two events, there is a commonality in which Beelzemon and Crosshearts are both topping the most compared to all of the other decks. If we take a look at all of the numbers and kind of quantify them, about 60% of the meta as far as what has topped has been Beelzemon or a Cross variant in some way, shape, or form, leading the pack in BT11 with these rule changes. Then on top of that, if you're going to combine both of the Crosshearts decks into one category, it's actually uh, taking up at 38% of the meta, which is a little bit on the high side compared to what we just saw with uh, Black War Greymon's uh, dominance uh, only being 33% of the meta. But uh, there are two variants, but the variants don't necessarily matter as much because you're mostly playing the same deck and you're just trading out the top end and support cards to support that top end. 
And then on top of that, uh, Latin America did have an event in this time frame, but unfortunately we don't have the full top 16 breakdown just yet, but just know that Black War Greymon X did win that event. So as far as uh, where the meta is currently heading, let's talk about Crosshearts. So Crosshearts is obviously one of the big decks in the formats just because it's taking up the majority of the top slots so far. So as far as uh, what's making this deck so good is there's two variants. There's the Cross 7 build and then there's the Merva build. And each one has its own slight pros and cons as far as which one is going to be more powerful, but right now they have about the same representation. Both builds also use the same core, which is basically just Rookie Rush 2.0, utilizing Tamers and the Digicross and Save mechanics to its benefit to not only make powerful plays for really cheap, but to also have a really good chip and aggro style of gameplay while you wait for those big pieces to come so that way you can make your power plays in the mid to late stages of the game. Then on top of that, you have just a plethora of different tools that your cards are going to be doing. And with the reduction of uh, Black War Greymon X being the deck's biggest natural counter because it has the most to tamer hate in the game currently, it just leaves Cross Hearts to be in a very good slot to basically go unchallenged. And then as far as Beelzemon, Beelzemon is going to be the other big forerunner deck as of right now based on these early results, and uh, the deck is a relatively easy deck to pick up. Similarly to Cross Hearts, it's fairly cheap to be able to attain a lot of the big core parts and pieces to be able to have a semblance of a playable deck. Yes, EX2 Beelzemon is a little bit on the expensive side, but uh, he was really cheap at one point, and a lot of players have probably already picked those up, or they're trying to pick them up right now, just because of the interest in the deck, because that's like the only expensive card in the deck, and everything else is pretty cheap in comparison. So uh, as far as what the Beelzemon deck actually is doing, it is a self-mill based deck having some of the most powerful mill effects uh, to turbo your trash as best as you can to be getting it into a particular state. And then once you're in that particular state, all of your cards will have some pretty powerful abilities. You could say there is an RNG aspect to the self-milling, but uh, the RNG only enhances the game plan and it's not just detracting or becoming too focused on the game plan. So when you hit those mill triggers, you're not necessarily expecting those mill triggers to go off, but when they do, it's just making your plays better and you are going to be making that play anyway to be able to trash your deck to be able to fill up your trash as quickly as you possibly can. Then the fact that you do have a lot of trash based interactions Interactions and there's not a whole lot of stuff interacting with the trash also puts the deck into some advantage just because it's playing with a uh, certain abilities and resources that you can't necessarily interact with and the deck is a pretty hyper aggressive deck because it needs to be due to how much it's going to be trashing in milling it wants to end the game before it's decking out. So as far as uh, things to kind of take a notice of uh, based on these two decks, uh, there's three major factors on what makes a deck good right now. The three main factors is going to be a deck speed or power. It's going to be uh, limiting the amount of interactions and interactability uh, that uh, the opponent has with you, and it's going to be your overall defensive game plan. If your deck has at least two of these three things, then you're in a pretty good spot, but if your deck has all three things, then you're definitely in a more favored spot. As far as what I define speed as, uh, it's how quickly a deck could get into its parts and pieces and find its parts and pieces as well. So uh, being able to uh, get into your uh, high level Digimon or your core cards as fast and as efficiently as you possibly can puts you at an advantage just because it gives you more ability to uh, not only be proactive but reactive as well. Then uh, the faster that you can go through your deck and the more consistent your deck is makes it so that it's easier for you to see and use your parts and pieces while you're taking advantage of the opponent not being able to see their parts and pieces or knowing that they won't be able to act or react in the same manner that you could to them. And then power is a pretty simple one. It's just the damage potential of the deck, which is basically the DPS and how much damage a deck deals. 
Then on top of that, uh, limiting your opponent's interactions with you is basically just what kind of protections you have in your deck to be able to uh, try to stop the opponent uh, from being able to get rid of your cards. So that way you could get more value off of your cards and use them as effective and efficiently as you possibly can. And then the defensive capabilities of the deck is just how well you're able to deal with the opponent's threats. And this can come in a multitude of different forms in the form of uh, removal and effects to be able to stop the opponent's actions like utilizing blocker to stop their attacks or using a redirect in that same manner. Then security control and recovery based decks kind of falls into its own little subcategory just because they're not necessarily trying to play towards any of these outside of uh, the defensive aspect of the deck, and they're not actively trying to win the game, they're just trying not to lose the game more often than not. So where do OTK decks fall into this meta? So OTK decks uh, will always uh, have a space in the meta because they always manage to steal a top spot or two in any given tournament just because of the nature of OTK based decks. The really strong decks that obviously uh, when they go off and combo off, they can kill the opponent and the faster and more consistent your OTK is, then the easier you'll be able to perform with that deck to be able to get those wins. On the flip side, it is kind of a high roll deck in large events just because a lot of uh, the deck is more matchup based rather than actual skill based. Yes, you do actually have to be skillful enough to be able to pilot your deck correctly, but if the opponent actually doesn't have any answers to your OTK based deck, then you're just going to be able to steamroll them if you're able to get into your parts and pieces and combo off quickly enough. But on the bright side, there actually is more ability to be able to counter OTK decks uh, now than we've had in some of the previous metas. So hopefully some of those decks that are actually able to counter these OTK decks can start to putting these OTK decks in check. But if you don't see your bad matchups uh, as the OTK player, then it literally just becomes a race against the opponent to be able to uh, find your parts and pieces. So more aggressive style of decks are also able to combat OTK based decks, as well as the ones that actually do just have mechanics uh, and cards to be able to deal with them. So moving forward in this meta, based on the results that we have, we could probably expect a lot more people to be looking at Crosshearts and Beelzeman in the future uh, tournaments and events, currently being the forerunners of the meta. Is this better than Black War Greymon X's dominance? Well, maybe. Only time will tell to see how the rest of the meta develops. Right now, Cross, as we know, is probably one of the more powerful and more popular decks. It's really cheap and easy to make, and uh, it's a fairly easy and accessible deck to be able to pick up and play. But uh, there are definitely some counter decks uh, to uh, Cross Hearts. Right now, it's just currently performing the best between both of its variations. And then, as far as one more thing to keep in mind, all of the data that I've been looking at right now has been of the two uh, large events that we've currently had. That's been about uh, seven to nine rounds, uh, consisting of uh, 100 or more players usually. I'm not necessarily looking at a whole bunch of medium to small events just because uh, they're on a different scale and because they're on a different scale and a different level than major events, uh, you kind of want to keep those data points separate. The less amount of rounds and the less amount of players, more different things could potentially happen in terms of what's able to top or not. But there's still a lot to explore within BT11, and I think that even though some decks didn't necessarily quite make a, a topping at a large event, doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the ability to. So as far as some honorable mentions of some decks that I still think are going to be good and uh, powerful in BT11 are going to be uh, decks like Blue Flare, Dorbikmon, uh, OTK, and various other OTK-based decks. Mastimon is still pretty good at having some decent offensive and defensive capabilities. Wargreymon X is also pretty good because if Black Wargreymon X could be good, then so can this, on top of this having a more offensive focus. Machine Dramon being a really solid uh, deck against uh, OTK decks and uh, having some of its own resilience also means that it could possibly do uh, very well in this type of environment. Then on top of 
that. You have uh, decks like Gallantmon. You have Beelstar, which did get some minor updates. Uh, then you also have Jessmon as another pretty decent deck that has a lot of uh, potential due to its toolboxing nature. So right now, we're still kind of in some unknown territories and unknown waters just because the meta is still relatively fresh and new. But as I mentioned before, we'll see how things develop going forward if a uh, cross hearts is as big of a problem as it seems, or if players and decks have the ability to be able to uh, counteract it and play against it. So that's all I really have for this video. As always, feel free to tell me your thoughts down in the comments below. And down in the description below are a couple of different ways you could support me and the channel. So I do have a, a TCG Player affiliate link. So when you use that link to buy cards off of TCG Player, then some of that money will go to supporting me and the channel. I also do make and sell playmats over on Overcard Gamers on Facebook. So when you buy a playmat with my design, then some of that money will also go to help supporting me and the channel. And on top of all of that, I do have a Twitch account over on twitch.tv slash Zenitsu. So giving me a follow and a subscription also helps support me there. And I do play Digimon on top of various other games on that platform as well. So thank you everyone for watching. And as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content. And I'll see you in the next video.